The story of the field of Karbala has been building up during the days of the month of Maharam. We get to the ninth night of Maharam and the final ultimatum is delivered. Imam Hussein is told that either he gives the oath of allegiance to Yazid or the army will attack and will pursue their attack right through to the death. There is no going back. This is the moment of decision. Imam Hussein asks for a few more hours of grace so that they can make their peace with God before the battle that will result in their ultimate death. An extension is given until the 10th day of Muharram, but it is made clear that there will be no further extension. Either he gives the oath or he faces the army. And so that night, Imam Hussein called together the whole of his company. He explained to them the situation that they were in, the inevitable death if they remained. He gave them permission to leave and to save themselves. We are told that he put out the candlelight so that they could go during the time of darkness and there would be no retribution against them. And when the candle was again lit, they were all in their places, preferring to die with the Imam rather than to save themselves through disgrace. And so it was that the night was spent in prayer, in seeking the mercy and forgiveness of God, in strengthening one another. Imam Hussein, speaking words of tenderness to his sister Zainab, strengthening her for what would come on the next day. And as daylight came, Imam Hussein and his companions, having completed their Fajr prayer, were standing in place to face the army of the Umayyads, impossibly outnumbered. And yet Imam Hussein refused to strike the first blow. He insisted that there should be a delay until the army of the Umayyads decided what they would do. He addressed them. He called upon the people of Kufar. He called upon those who had written the letters of invitation, even at this late hour, to be true to their invitation, to be true to their word. And they denied him and they denied that they had written. And so the die was cast. The battle opened with a volley of arrows from the archers of the Umayyads, with the charge of the cavalry. And the troops, the company of Imam Hussein, responded in like measure. Imam Hussein had given them their orders as to the places that they should take up in battle, who should go to the right flank and who to the left and who to the center. He had ordered that the tents should be moved closer together during the night, that a ditch should be dug to both sides in the rear of the camp, and that it should be filled with firewood 
so that it could be set on fire, so that any attack would have to be directly to the front of the encampment. And so the battle continued. The companions of Imam Hussein came to him one by one, seeking permission to enter the field of battle to face the soldiers of the enemy, and they went out single-handed to their deaths. It was a brutal affair. Bodies were butchered, were torn, and were broken. The bodies were brought back into the camp of Imam Hussein and a tent was designated so that they could be laid out there with dignity and with honour as would befit those who have died in the noble cause of martyrdom. The women of the company having prepared their men to go into the field of battle having supported them in prayer whilst they fought, then received back their bodies and laid them out in dignity. And so things went on until all the companions of Imam Hussein had died. They ranged in age from old men who were grandfathers to young boys hardly reaching the age of, puri of puberty. They ranged in class from those who were of noble birth to those who were servants. But Imam Hussein, again, true to his principle of the equality of every human being, made it clear to those who were the servants amongst his company that they were freed, that they were now free men, that there was no requirement or command upon them to go to face the enemy, that it should be their free choice. If they chose, then they chose to die in the cause like any other free and noble human being, sacrificing their life for the cause of Imam Hussein, and thus for the cause of God. We know that the Imam went to those who were dying in the field of battle. He went to bring them comfort. He went to pray with them, in their last moments, to close their eyes in death. And so it went on. He would lay his cheek upon the cheek of his former servant, so that the comfort of the presence of the Imam should strengthen him in his final agony. And when all the companions had met their end, only the family of Imam Hussein, the family who remained with him, 17 men and boys in total, only they remained to stand with him. And still the arrows came on, and still the enemy pursued the fight. And so the members of the family, one by one, would come to seek permission from the Imam to go into the field of battle. We think here of the sons of Imam Hassan, who died on that day. We think of the sons of Muslim Ibn Dakil, who died on that day. We think of all those who were the descendants of Ali, 
who realized their full potential in martyrdom on that day. We consider the death of two of the sons of Imam Hussein himself. Two sons who gave their lives, one as a full-grown man making his decision, one as a baby in the arms of his father who was cruelly killed by a shot from the Umayyad archers when Imam Hussein was begging for water for the baby. The baby can do you no harm, he said. For God's sake, have mercy upon the baby. And yet also, his life was sacrificed on this day. And so we see from the oldest to the youngest, their lives all were given for the cause. Eventually, only Imam Hussein himself remained amongst the men of his company. And so it became clear that the final part of the story was about to unfold. Two important things that Imam Hussein did before the end would come. First, he went to the women of his company and he strengthened them in their commitment and in their faith. He steeled their courage for whatever would befall them after the battle itself. And he commended them to God in prayer. And then he went to his one remaining son, Zain al Abidin. The beauty, the glory of the believers, the one who would strengthen the faith of the community after the day of Ashura, who would assume that great dignity of being the Imam who would carry on the work and the message of the Imamat. Zain al Abidin had been too ill to fight on this day. He was very weak with fever. Even when he had tried to rise from his sick bed, his aunt, Lady Zainab, had had to help him back because he was too weak even to stand. But his father went to him. He gave him the designation as the next Imam. He spoke words to him unknown to us, secret words of one Imam to another to communicate to him the dignity, the privilege that he was about to take on. And then he left him. Imam Hussein then mounted his horse, prepared himself to face the enemy as one man alone against a multitude. And he rode out fearlessly into the battle. He had already suffered wounds and cuts from earlier victims earlier attacks upon him and yet bravely he rode out until they were awed by his presence no one wanted to press home the attack until the order was given to attack all together all together to attack to strike him from his horse to strike him to the ground and eventually the death blow was dealt and he was killed. And thus ended the life on this earth of Imam Hussein. And yet he struck a 
blow that would last for all eternity, that truth and justice must always stand against iniquity and against tyranny, and thus the memory of Hussein lives on forever.